Good morning. Please turn in your Bibles to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 to 16 this morning. This fall we started a little series on the church and three weeks ago I spoke of the church as the hope of the world because the church shares the gospel message about Jesus. Two weeks ago I spoke on the church as being a volunteer organization. Oh, someone's just getting my attention there. We should take up the offering. We didn't do that yet. We'll take up the offering. <laughs> As, as, I, uh, as I begin the sermon, we'll call up the ushers there for, for this morning's offering. Good thing I looked up. It would have been halfway through the sermon there. Two weeks ago, I spoke of the church as a volunteer organization. It's not run by professionals. It's run by, by volunteers, by, by everyday people serving the Lord with passion. And then last week we took a little break, of course, and last week we watched that Value of a Soul DVD with incredible testimonies and some speaking by Franklin Graham and just a special and unusual Sunday there that we've never done that before, but we decided to do that one time to share that gospel message with everybody. And today we get back to this series on the, the church, today looking primarily at the church as the pillar of the truth and looking at that passage from 1 Timothy chapter 3. So I'm going to, uh, going to just pray as the offering kind of finishes up there, and then we'll, we'll get into the, the sermon. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this morning. We thank you for your great love for us. And Lord, we thank you for your great word that you have given to us, your inspired and inerrant, perfect word that we can look into and that we can learn from uh, day by day on our own and week by week as we gather together for these services. And Lord, we pray that you would open our, our hearts and minds to what you would have us uh, as a church uh, learn and, and grow from this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you were to ask a whole bunch of people, just take a survey and ask people, why is the church important? You would probably get a, a wide variety of responses. Sadly, you would naturally get some people, I guess, nowadays that would say, well, the church is not important. They'd say, what a, what a silly question. They'd say the church is, is not important at all. Other people might say, well, the church, I guess it's important for special occasions, weddings, funerals, Christmas, Easter. The church is important just for those occasions. Or, or some people might say, well, the church, it's just there to, to help people feel good about themselves. That's all it's really important for. Or some people might say, oh, the church is good to teach children, but, but I'm growing up now, you know, it's more for, for children than it is for me. But imagine if somebody said... The church is important because the, the church of Jesus Christ has the most important task in the world today. The task is more important than all the governments and media and universities in the world combined. There's nothing compared to the church because truth matters and the church is the pillar and foundation of the truth. Half the things the government seem to say aren't necessarily true. More than half the things the media says don't seem to be true. Sometimes university professors will teach their students and things that aren't true about the world and their worldview. But the church knows and tells the truth. And that's why the church is important in the world today. That'd be a great response because that would be along the lines of our scripture passage today from 1 Timothy 3 verses 14 to 16. Let's read it together. God says this through the Apostle Paul. I hope to come to you soon, but I'm writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. Before we get to that phrase about the church as a pillar and buttress of the truth, first let's look earlier in verse 15 and see what this passage says about the church. Because the Apostle Paul says he's writing these things so that people will know how they ought to behave in the church, which he first calls the household of God and secondly calls the church of the living God. So in a way, everything else he's writing in 1 Timothy is designed to help people to know how they ought to live and behave within the church. Which makes one obvious small point by implication, which is that he expects believers in Jesus Christ to be in church. 
There is no place or category in the Bible for Christians who don't attend church. That's just, just crazy and wrong. The Bible always assumes that Christians will be in church and will be a part of a church. If we were to play a word association game, and the words on one side of the paper were fish, birds, worms, people in Sudbury, and Christians. And then on the other side of the piece of paper were these five words. Dirt, water, sky, church, and Tim Hortons. We could easily tell which word goes with which word there. It's not complicated. We, we would know clearly that fish goes with water, bird goes with sky, worms go with dirt, people in Sudbury go with Tim Hortons, and Christians go with church. It's not rocket science, nor is it brain surgery. It's simple. It's a, it should be as natural for Christians to go to church as it is for birds to fly in the sky. Birds shouldn't come up with long lists of excuses of why they don't want to fly in the sky. Christians shouldn't come up with long lists of excuses of why they don't want to go to church or be a part of a church. It's simple, it's natural, and you see that by implication here in this verse. I'm not going to spend long on that point. That's, it's so clear and we know that. But I wanted to mention it because we all probably do know some believers in Christ who, who aren't part of a church. And that's, they're, they're mistaken. Sometimes people will say, well, there's no Bible verse that says you have to be part of a church. And actually there is, but, but beyond that, there's also lots of Bible verses like this one that imply or assume that obviously believers are going to be part of a church. First Timothy 3 here says, Paul's writing so he, he, people can know how to behave in the household of God. He, he assumes all through Timothy and God assumes all throughout the Bible that Christians are going to be part of a church. It's a very natural thing and right thing for us as believers to do. And so Paul talks about the church life a lot throughout all of the New, the New Testament, including 1 Timothy, and, and even including talking in the verses before today's passage. If you skim back further up in this chapter, he talks about elders and deacons and how a church should function because God wants the church to function properly, and he wants from this verse 15 for us to know of the church as being the household of God. Why wouldn't we want to be part of the household of God? We should want to be part of the household of God. And, and, and we, we ourselves as believers, we are the, the household of God and we should live accordingly and care for each other and, and get to know each other and spend time with each other like a household or an extended family or a family would do. We should get to know each other not just on the weekends. We should, we should be involved in, in the church family and with the church family in many ways. Certainly on, on Sunday mornings for, for Sunday services, but more than that as well. During the week and in small group Bible studies. I hope you signed up already or you will later today for a small group. And, and also during the week in, in less formal ways as well. Getting together for meals with each other and, and getting together for visits and getting together for games and walks and, and baby showers and all these different things that people get together with for around here. That's a great part of being the household of God. And if you're not getting together and interacting with, with some other believers here during the week, you are missing out on, on a lot of what the church is designed to be. And I encourage you to take part in more than just Sunday. We're glad that it's obviously great and you should prioritize being here on Sunday. But the church is more than that as well and could be more than that for you if you would get involved in other ways as well. Notice the next phrase in the passage. It says, I hope to come to you soon, but I'm writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God. The household of God is also called the church of the living God because God is alive and the church is ultimately his church. Every believer in Jesus Christ belongs to the, the universal worldwide church all over the world. We belong to that church of the living God. And then every individual local church that believes in Jesus and teaches his Bible is also called a local church of the living God. One day, many years ago, the phone rang in the office of the church in Washington, D.C., where the president was known to sometimes attend. And an eager voice said, Do you expect the president to be there this Sunday? And the pastor replied, That I cannot promise, but we do expect the living God to be there. And we fancy that that should be incentive enough for you to come. Not a bad answer, right? We need to know and expect that the living God will meet with us in a special way when we gather together. Because God's not dead, he is living and active.
active in our individual lives and in our life together as a church family of the living God. And if you are new here or fairly new here, you don't know very much about church, I want to encourage you to continue to come over and over again, week after week, and become a part of this church family, this household of the living God where we love Jesus and we teach His Word, the Bible, because God is in our midst. This is a great place for you to be, and you are very welcome to be here. Now the church of the living God, the household of God, is also, according to the end of verse 15, the pillar and foundation, or pillar and buttress of the truth. The church itself is not the source of truth. Okay, don't make a mistake here. The source of truth is the written word of God. The Bible alone is the source of truth. Don't make a mistake here and start thinking that the the church or church tradition can be equal with the Bible. Never. The Bible, scripture alone, that's one of the solas we'll be studying in our small groups in the in the month or two to come. The scripture alone is the is the source of, of truth. The Bible is a source of truth, but the church is to proclaim the truth that is written down in the Bible, and the truth, the church is to be the unshakable pillar and buttress and backbone and foundation of the truth. The ESV version of the Bible says the church here is a pillar and buttress of the truth. The NIV says a pillar and foundation of the truth. The the CEB says the church is the backbone and support of the truth. Sadly, many people hardly even believe in truth anymore, it seems. They, they seem to think that everything's just relative and it may be true for you, but not for, for them, and that there's no such thing as absolute truth. But really, that's impossible and, and nonsensical, because in order to, for someone to say that there's no such thing as absolute truth, they have to make an absolute truth statement. And so the statement defeats itself very quickly. But... The church, we as believers in Jesus Christ, we need to continue to believe that there certainly are some things that are absolutely true and we need to hold fast and proclaim that truth. And what is the primary truth that we who believe in Jesus Christ and therefore make up the church, what is the primary truth that we are the pillar and buttress of? The primary truth is is in the very next verse in our passage which says, that the, the mystery of godliness or the mystery of salvation and then says the gospel of Jesus Christ. Interestingly, Pastor Inza mentioned this to the kids a little bit this morning with the box there, but when the word mystery comes up in the Bible, it's referring to something that was previously hidden and now has been fully revealed, namely the gospel message of Jesus Christ, the full, clear gospel message that we know. And, and verse 16 here is an excerpt from an early gospel hymn that the early believers would, would sing about Christ, similar to that one day hymn that we just sang as it goes through different parts of the gospel message and the message of Jesus Christ. It says, He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up in glory. A six-part hymn here and part of the inspired Word of God. First is the truth that Jesus was manifested in the flesh, which refers to Jesus Christ taking on human flesh, becoming man while continuing to be God in what is called the incarnation of Christ. John begins his gospel about Jesus, calling him the Word there, saying, In the beginning was the Word, that's Jesus, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then in verse 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's the incarnation of Christ. Larry Richards writes, The doctrine of the Incarnation is distinct and unique to the Christian faith. Many religions speak of appearances of deities in the guise of men or animals, but these are appearances only. None take the startling position of Christianity, which affirms that God, who existed from eternity and who created all things, entered into his creation and actually became a human being. End quote. What an amazing king. To think that a king would become a peasant to save peasants. And here we have the the king of all kings coming down to earth, becoming a human person in order to save human people. It's amazing and wonderful and should make us happy to think about it. 
And then the second phrase in that verse is, Jesus was vindicated by the Spirit, which refers to God's Spirit raising Jesus from the dead as a vindication or a proof that Jesus really was God the Son, the Savior of the world who died for our sins. And then the third phrase is that Jesus was seen by angels. And this is a reference to his ascension back into heaven and being seen by angels. Then the fourth phrase is proclaimed among the nations. And this is a reference to the gospel message being proclaimed in the, throughout the known world at the, the time of the early Christians, proclaimed among the nations and continuing to this day to be proclaimed among the nations. And then the fifth phrase is, he was believed on in the world, which naturally describes the response of many people when they hear the gospel message of Jesus Christ. They believe on Jesus Christ for salvation. And then the sixth and final phrase says, Jesus was taken up in glory. At first glance, this seems like another uh, reference to his ascension of going back up into heaven, but it's probably more than that. It probably is also really meaning to emphasize the glory that Jesus receives as the glorified Savior back in heaven and the glory that he now receives and will forever more receive. So what's the primary truth that we as the church are a pillar and buttress and foundation and backbone of? The primary truth is the truth of the gospel, the truth of Jesus Christ's death on the cross for our sins, his resurrection, his ascension back into heaven, the need to proclaim the gospel message to the whole world in order that people may believe in Jesus and thus be saved. And in every generation, the truth of the gospel is going to get attacked in various different ways by various different groups of people. And in every generation, the church is supposed to stand strong on the word of God as the pillar and buttress and foundation and backbone of the truth of the gospel. The problem comes when some churches have no backbone and so they fall into compromising the gospel in one way or another or trying to make the gospel fit more nicely with the culture rather than remembering that some elements of the gospel message will always be countercultural. Some so-called churches have no backbone, and so if the culture decided years ago that it doesn't believe in miracles, that miracles are impossible, then, then some of these so-called churches will say that they no longer believe that Jesus actually rose from the dead physically, since that would be a miracle, obviously. And so they just say, Jesus didn't really rise from the dead. When we celebrate his resurrection and stuff, we're just talking about Jesus rising in our hearts whenever we think about him. And really, as soon as a church starts saying something like that, they're no longer really a church, even though they, get, they keep getting called a church. But they're certainly not being a church and a pillar and buttress of the truth the way they should be. Or other churches won't go that far. They'll still believe in Jesus' death and in Jesus' resurrection, but they'll compromise some other area of the gospel. For example, they might say, yes, yes, we believe that Jesus died on the cross. But he didn't die to pay for our sins since God is righteous and holy and, and, he, and he judges sin and there must be a, a punishment for sin. No, no, he didn't die to, for that reason. He just died to show us that he loves us. And at first glance, if somebody says, well, Jesus died to show us that he loves us, that's good and true as far as it goes. In fact, it's wonderful. It's beautiful. Jesus loves us. He died for us. But if people in churches deny that Jesus died to pay the penalty for our sins, that Jesus died as our substitute on the cross, then they have compromised and distorted the gospel message and they're no longer a pillar and buttress of the truth. Or some churches will say that you don't even have to consciously believe in Jesus in this life to be saved, but you could be saved by some other means or, or you get a second chance after death even though the Bible says otherwise or, or that everybody makes it to heaven in the end. And, and that's a completely false and foreign teaching to the Scripture. We're supposed to, as a church, hold firm to the teachings of the Scripture and proclaim and be a pillar and buttress of the truth, not to compromise it and start watering it down. We as Christians and as a church are only doing our job when we're doing what Jude 1 verse 3 says, contending for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. We're supposed to be a pillar and buttress and foundation of the truth. What good is a pillar or a foundation if it compromises and crumbles when pressure is put on it? 
there's always going to be all kinds of pressure on the church to compromise, to cave into the culture's ideas or the culture's worldview in one way or another. The true churches like us must always resist the temptation to compromise and must stay true constantly to God's word and say, no compromise. We are a pillar and a buttress of the truth of the word of God and we're not going to compromise it. We're not going to water it down. We're not going to crumble to the ways of the world and the shifting sands of a constantly changing culture. Another way that some churches will get off track from being a pillar and buttress of the truth it's not that they will take away from what the Bible says, like those few, few examples I've just given, but some will want to add to what the Bible says, making up extra lists of rules that are not in the Bible. For example, in Galatians 2, verses 3 to 5, there were some people who wanted to add extra rules onto the Christian life. In this particular case, they were called Judaizers. They wanted to make the Christians go back to following the Old Testament rules like circumcision, and Paul writes under God's inspiration, Galatians 2, 3 to 5, Yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. This matter arose because some false believers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. We did not give in to them for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. I love how the ESV puts it actually in verse 5 when it says, To them we did not yield in submission even for a moment, so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. He says we didn't yield in submission, we didn't give in to, for even one moment to adding things to the Bible. And this was a, a very big deal. Why? Because the truth of the gospel was at stake and he wanted to preserve the truth of the gospel which is that we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ not by any sorts of works and we shouldn't be adding extra do's and don'ts onto the Christian life either that aren't part of the new covenant and part of the New Testament of the Bible or of God's moral law. So to be a pillar and a foundation of the truth. On the one hand, we must not take anything away from the Bible. On the other hand, we must not try to add things to God's Word. And I think it should be mentioned that while we are being the pillar and buttress of the truth, we should be the pillar in the most loving and winsome and caring and grace-filled way possible. Some people seem to want to defend God's Word but they want to do it in the most angry, abrasive, grumpy way possible, just annoying people. And, and we shouldn't be like that. We should defend God's word, certainly. Be a pillar and buttress of the truth. And be it in love and kindness. And yes, certainly, when push comes to shove, with absolute firmness as well. But there's a difference between being firm and assertive compared to being abrasive and mean on purpose. Though there will be times when no matter how lovingly and kindly we say something, some people are not going to like what we have to say. doesn't matter how nicely you say it, some people do not want to be told that Jesus is the only way to God. But Jesus is the only way to God. That's the way it is. And so we, as a pillar and buttress of the truth, continue to proclaim that. So in conclusion, short message here, because we're going to move into communion shortly. In conclusion, the church is important because the church is the household of the living God and the church is a pillar and buttress and foundation and backbone of the truth of the Bible. First and foremost, we need to stand and be the pillar and buttress of the truth of the gospel. But also, we can't stop there. If we, if we were to go on longer, we'd talk about how we need to be a pillar and buttress of the whole entire council of Scripture teaching and holding fast to everything that the Bible says. Whether those things are easy and popular and everyone in Sudbury agrees with us, or whether those things are difficult and hard and most people in Sudbury disagree with us. We're on the Lord's side. We're part of the household of God, the church of the living God, and we are a pillar and buttress of the truth. We're to shine like stars in the midst of a world that is backwards and confused and upside down about all kinds of issues. Sometimes we think about how our, our culture, we think it's, it's crooked and twisted. 
Now that's not new to the year 2017. That's, that's as old as 2,000 years ago when the Bible was written. Listen to Philippians 2 verses 14 to 16. It says, Do all things without grumbling or questioning, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. Things have always been crooked and twisted in one way or another. Seems like it's getting worse to us. Well, it seemed like it was getting worse to them 2,000 years ago as well. In the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine like, like lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Or think of a couple more scriptures. 2 Timothy 3 verse 13 says, Follow the pattern of sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Jesus Christ. Philippians said, Holding fast to the word of life. 2 Timothy says, Follow that pattern of sound words. Titus 1 verse 9 says, He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also rebuke those who contradict it. Let's hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught as a pillar and, and buttress of the truth. We all must do this. We must be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and even to rebuke people when they contradict the truth of God's word. So maybe shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, following the pattern of sound words, holding firm to the trustworthy word as taught, contending for the faith, and being that pillar and foundation and buttress and backbone of the truth that we were meant to be. Let's close in prayer and then we'll call up the worship team for another song and then transition into the Lord's table. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word that you have written and preserved for us, your perfect word. Lord, help each of us as individuals and our church together as a, as a whole, as a group, of, as a household of the living God to continually be that pillar and buttress of the, of the truth. The truth of the gospel message and the truth of everything that is taught in the whole counsel of Scripture. Let us not try to be a, a pillar that crumbles and compromises, but a pillar that stands strong on your word. Empower us to do that, we pray. We thank you for your word once more. In Jesus' name, amen.